Hello everybody, my name is Michael, and this is my channel. It's getting late, and there's a few more topics that I want to go over before I stop recording for tonight, or just fall asleep on the chair. We'll see what happens first. One of the things that really got me into D&D to begin with was the romanticized notion in my head of the mercenary. Who doesn't love that image? A swashbuckling man in armor and a sword at his hip. He is a man to his own beholding. He fights for who he wants, he kills who he wants. He can do good if he wants, he can be that road warrior, that rogue who saves the day, but uh, I'm no hero, I'm just a mercenary. I do it for coin. I loved that image when I was a kid. I honestly did. And I read book after book after book about mercenaries and what they wore, how they lived. I, I remember looking up at a very early age, brigandy, uh, a type of armor very commonly worn by mercenaries. The moment I got into d and I made my character wear it. It is basically a leather vest with these steel plates riveted to the inside, and I loved running around in, with my character. Granted, it didn't give me much AC, but I didn't care. I had this image in my head, and I was awesome. And then I got older, and I started doing actual research into them. I had read about the White Company and other such things earlier, but I, I never really got to see the darker side of mercenaries. And as I started reading reports on the White Company and other medieval uh, manuscripts, you start to realize that mercenaries aren't very good people. They never really were. It is said that in the German provinces where Lensknechts were recruited, literally prisons would be emptied, allowing these soldiers to join in the name of their lords if they provided year worth of service. Lensknechts and other such soldiers were prisoners, they were bandits, they were outlaws, rapists, so much more bastards, uh, hedge knights. Until I heard one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite mercenaries of all time, from the Game of Thrones. Tyrion looks at him and asks him with a brow cocked, tell me, would you without question Fall in order, I gave you, to kill a child still at her mother's breast. Would you follow that order without hesitation? Brom looks to Tyrion and says, Without hesitation, no. I'd ask how much. And that's where things changed. Let's talk about it. Mercenaries, as an idea, are things as old as time. Egypt hired mercenaries. Greece hired mercenaries. The Persians hired mercenaries. The Chinese hired mercenaries. Even the Japanese. And there are tales, even, of Aztec mercenaries. These soldiers of fortune have gone back farther than anyone can truly remember. And there is always one defining factor of them. They, they were not good people. I dare to say that no one from their time period who killed people for a living was good people. Where mercenaries go, death, rape, pillaging follows, as mercenaries are a business, and they will take whatever they can get. They are essentially hired thugs, soldiers that have no allegiance to land or home. They are despised by all, for they are harbingers of death. This is the common thought I had in my head after I'd done all my research. Many like to romanticize the idea of a mercenary, fighting for the right cause, for the right coin, of course. This was rarely the case. Yet, why do I still use mercenary companies as a basis for many of my campaigns. Why do so many of my campaigns start with the players being part of a larger mercenary company and being subcontracted out? Because mercenaries and soldiers of fortune have one defining trait above knights or other such thugs. Mercenaries can choose their masters. They cannot blame on God. They cannot blame on their ties to their lord or for honor. They can't hide behind the skirt of family crests. Everything they do is on them. And that's really what I liked 
Ronin were considered the most dishonorable sort of soldier in feudal Japan, yet we hear stories of Ronin. The seven Ronin come to mind, actually, as these landless mercenaries have a choice and take it. Whilst other soldiers have pledged their allegiance and honor to their lord, these men are only loyal to themselves and their own morals. Now, I'm not saying that the majority of these men were good men, but when I play my D&D characters in my games, I try to envision that. Zoltan Chive, possibly another one of my favorite fictional characters from the Witcher series, made a good line about the morals of being a soldier and doing moral things. It is useless to waste your efforts to do good on things that will not grow into fruition. So I save my efforts and do good where I know it'll make a difference. This has been a bit of a, bit of a rant video on generally my thoughts on mercenaries and how it's kind of moved from this idealized alpha male doing work to the scum of the earth and sort of back to a more realistic view of what these mercenaries really were, or at least the ones I intend to play. They are men who know the realities of the world, that the world is violent, full of knights and soldiers who, under the guise of following honor and command, will do atrocious things and then hide behind those orders, saying that it wasn't them. The mercenary stands, and he stands on his own, on his own morals, and on his own two feet. My first character I ever played was named Revit. A sellsword. He's dead now. And he died doing something that he believed was good. And who knows? Maybe he'll be brought back. So if you ever do play a mercenary, remember this little rant I did. Think about how he would think about his morals. Is morals dead to him? Is he simply about the coin? Or maybe he believes that he can really do some good in the world. He just has to find a meaningful good. Something that'll actually matter. And be worth his time and effort to put in. My name is Michael. This is my channel. Thanks for watching. As a side note, I think I'm getting buzzed.